Yeah. It's real. Okay. So welcome everyone. And uh, we are here in uh, Europe and around the world. <laughs> and so our speaker today is from Oslo, uh, Nadia, Nadia Larsen. Equilibrium states for sister algebra of the right least common multiple monoids. Please, please, Nadia. Yes. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to give this talk in the non commutative online, uh, non -competitive geometry online seminar. Um, so I will um, take you through uh, what I hope is an introduction to also to the motivation for why we study equilibrium states for cisstrage Russell of monoids, why those right LCM, right least common multiples are interesting and a bit to get into most of the, the, the most recent results, the state of the art. And quite a bit of what I want to discuss today is from a recent joint work with uh, my colleagues, Nathan Brownlow and Jackie Ramage from University of Sydney and Nikolai Stammeyer, uh, who is um, uh, a postdoc at University of Oslo. So, um, just a very brief outline. Um, I will explain a little bit why isometries uh, in, in, in sister algebras are interesting from the point of view of equilibrium states. Uh, what are the right LCM monoids there for? Why are they good? And um, note that there's a permutation of the words because what the right LCM stands is an abbreviation of, is really just taking the least common right multiple of elements. We will see, it's, it's a bit of thinking of monoids where we can, in a certain sense, form kind of fractions, but not just uh, in the ORE sense. Uh, and this is going very fast. I will ex explain some examples, most notably bounce-like solitaire monoids. So maybe bounce-like solitaire groups are not unknown, uh, but there's another much larger class. So what bounce lock solitaire monoids are so-called one relators. That's there's one relation defining the monoid. There are other types of monoids which maybe fit into this label of Zapajep. I'll talk about scales of on semigroups leading to time evolutions and equilibrium and explain some classification results. So the first slide is uh, it's motivational and it's kind of informal, it's not very precise. Uh, but if, if we have a cis algebra with the one parameter group off, so it's a group of automorphism of the real line uh, and they are pointwise continuous. Um, suppose we have an element V in our cis algebra A with the properties of an isometry that's not a unitary. So V star V is identity, we assume A is unitary, and V V star is a projection, but not the identity. And suppose we have some way to assign a number to this V, some positive number. And suppose that this one parameter group assigns to V just the scale value of V with N of V to the IT. Now, if we have an equilibrium state at the parameter beta, what we have is a state on A, so it's a positive functional on A. And I will, We'll see the definition later, but for the moment that we just think of it as being a trace up to a factor. And because it's a trace up to a factor, if we apply it to this isometry that we have there, phi of V star V will, through the relation that it determines it, it will give us phi of V V star multiplied with this factor that depends on beta and here is N of V to the beta. But phi is a state, so this all this is one. So an equilibrium state, when we have an isometry, will tell us that the value phi of VV star is determined. So now, how do we get isometries in, how we get cis algebras with lots of isometries? Well, if you think of group cis algebras, well, when we define them, they're defined by unitaries and universal properties in terms of unitaries, at least for, at least for a discrete group. If we have a left cancellative monoid, I will call it P, um, simply because P is a relic of terminology of positive cone, uh, but that usually comes with the groups. So it, in what I talk here, that need not be a group around that contains P. Um, but if P is left cancellative, and we think of trying to associate the cis algebra to P, the most obvious type of assignment will, uh, will give us a cis algebra joined by isometries VP that will satisfy the multipl a multiplication rule modeled on P with maybe more relations, we will see. And if we 
can start with a homomorphism of P to the, let's say the positive line, a multiplicative, we think of it multiplicatively, we will be able to uh, lift it to an, uh, to an action on, on this sister algebra of P simply by scaling every um, isometry V sub P with N of P to the I theta. So this is our action. And if we are to have an equilibrium state phi of beta at some parameter beta, then we know that it will have to have prescribed values uh, at those projections. So VP, VP star, those will be projections. And for all those, we will need prescribed values, namely N of VP to the minus beta. So then we can ask, do any exist? And if we get the answer yes, then we will try to understand why they exist. Okay, so um, just to move a bit off, so just repeat uh, that we are, our setup is some left cancellative monoid, a sister algebra somehow generated by that, which we think of having universal properties. It will be generated by a family of isometries, multiplicative family of isometries VP with additional properties to have some good properties. And some homomorphism of on P, which scales all those isometries. So as, as I said, an equilibrium state of beta, at beta will have prescribed values at, at a, a large family of, of um, projections in the sister algebra. So we can ask a couple of, a number of questions. First of all, if we are give ourselves a positive, let's say a positive beta, do equilibrium states exist at that beta? And if they do exist, where do they come from? I mean, do they come from some sub algebra? They obviously they have to be living somewhere, but where? Um, and maybe if we do find one at a certain beta with this prescribed uh, sets of values at those projections, how many are there is? Also, if we happen to find several at for different betas, so for different prescribed values of those on those projections at different parameters beta, are they of the same type? And here type, you could really think of it in the von Neumann algebra sense. So do the, if, if we get are, are lucky enough and get factors, what type do those factors have? And I will try to illustrate some of those situations. But before that, let me uh, just formally describe the, the, uh, the, what the uh, uh, an equilibrium state. And I will simply use the definition of, a, of an equilibrium state or a KMS state. The definition um, is, was coined down by Rudolf Haag, Nico Hugenholz, and Marinus Winning. So I think Hugenholz was in Leiden and Winning was in, in Groningen, so both of them in the Netherlands. So back in the 1967, they were looking at extracting an abstract formula or an abstract understanding of equilibrium uh, based on the boundary type conditions that uh, were satisfied for the green functions um, in, in finite systems. And they tried to lift it to the infinite systems as limits of finite systems. So by analogy with finite systems, where you look at the Sistrage buff and by matrices and their gift states simply given through a density matrix, they extended the notion of KMS state. And, and they also define a, there's a notion of a ground state. So the KMS stands for Kuba, Martin, and Schwinger. So the data is a Sistra algebra, a time evolution or a one parameter action of R on A and some parameter beta, let me take it greater than or equal to zero. Although I have to be careful when I write at zero, okay. At zero, we have to be careful because that would correspond to a trace, okay. So I should have zero, uh, just open interval. So state is a KMS beta state if it is a trace, but up to applying a factor. So phi of AB is phi of the product of B with sigma at parameter I beta applied to A. And for this to be possible, we need to make sense of sigma i beta for a complex parameter. So we will work with a so-called analytic elements, meaning that this uh, one parameter action, this map t from r to the sigma t of a to the sister algebra has an extension, in fact, a unique extension to an um, analytic function. Um, and we can ask this that also B is analytic and then this formula takes on a more symmetric form where we apply sigma IB over half with adjoints, but I don't, I don't need it right now. There's an, uh, this is not the original definition. I mean, the original definition, um, rather than uh, uh, assuming that this happens where A is, a, is an analytic element, allows it to happen for all elements, but 
that builds in the existence of, a, of an analytic function which is bounded and interpolates between values on a certain strip between t and t plus i beta or yeah okay but think of a KMS state as a state with a certain type of not quite trace condition but similar to a trace condition where this action plays a role and it will also be interesting for the for, to, for the distinction to speak of so-called ground states. And those are states where for the analytic elements, when we map the function z from the complex plane to the value of the state at uh, a sigma z of b, we get something that's bounded in the upper half plane. So in a certain sense, ground states would kind of correspond to beta infinite, but not exactly. There's also a notion of KMS infinity states but those only exist if there are many KMS beta states and we are able to take a weak star limit of, of KMS beta states as beta grows to infinity. Okay, so the analytic elements are plenty. They form a dense subalgebra. In the case of interest for us, those sister of P, the analytic elements simply will, we will find them among pro, pro, products of the form VP, VQ star. Okay, so let me show you one situation where such a, uh, a sister algebra of a monoid uh, has plenty of KMS states and actually very nice, uh, um, let's say distribution of KMS states. So what is the monoid? If you look there, so this is a result of Marcel Laca and Ian Rayburn from 2010. We look at the universal sister algebra associated to an affine monoid. So N, the first copy of N is an additive a monoid, the second copy of n, the non-zero, let's say, acts multiplicatively. The times is there to indicate it acts multiplicatively. The whole thing is generated by, do, do I answer the chat or do you? Okay, so the whole thing is generated by many isometries. There is one isometry S for n, and there is, um, why do analytic elements form a star subalgebra? So there's, okay, there's a, yeah, that, that's that's a sort of a standard re results that they, that there's there's some approximation using some Fourier coefficients. Okay, so the S, there's an S for the additive copy and for the multiplicative copy through the prime factorization, we think of all the P's are there and we encode every prime by an isometry VP. And then there's a bunch of relations, five relations. Maybe we don't have to, to, to look at all of them, but somehow understand that whether, because this semi-group, this monoid is not uh, abelian, when we try to pass from a, an addition to multiplication or the other way around, those elements will reflect what happens. But what's important from the KMS point of view is that the additive part of the monoid N is not transformed by dynamics, but the multiplicative part, sigma T of VP is scaled exactly as we, as, as I prescribed, I said by some homomorphism and the value at P, it's simply the prime P here. And this lifts to all of N star, so this does give an action. But what's, Okay, what do I want to know? So I've activated the chat and now I cannot go back to my file. So uh, you, you click again on chat, they should disappear. Okay, I'll try. Hmm. That doesn't look so good. Uh, do we I've, uh, okay, let me go back to the chat and um, but we could see your um, your file, yeah. Yes, but I do not see my next line. I don't. I don't see my file is moving uh, forward. Okay. I'm sorry. Do you see? I don't see. It's it's stuck on my screen. Okay. At the line ending with then. Then that's right. Yeah. Okay. So does anything? I mean, what happens if we start using the chat? Um, shall we do the drastic thing that you close the file and you start the, the Okay. 
Okay, well, I tried to write starting in, in the chat and see what happens, but no, I'm sorry, my, um, I should maybe have stopped the share. Uh, I, I cannot move on, so what do we do? So I just stop the share and try again? Uh, I think I would just uh, close your file and then we, we, we open it again. Close your, uh, okay, yeah, let's try. Okay, but we still are there. I, I've started sharing, but I just cannot move on. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what is happening. We are again, we are again at uh, the page as before. Yes, my file is, is frozen there. Um... But it seems to be on your computer, so it's uh, right? Mm, yeah. It's frozen okay. on your computer. Yeah. So you just maybe open the file again and then start sharing. Yes, I'll try. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm sorry, Valtra. So now I, I, none of these very basic things I know seems to work. So I normally just quit the file by going to, by choosing escape and it just takes me out. And um, so, I mean, maybe the, <laughs> I would, I would hate to just have to stop the, uh, just, just leave the meeting and start again. It will be very silly, but I don't see what else to do. But just aren't my, you uh, somewhere in a PDF reader or so? I mean, I, I, yes, I've, I've, I usually get out of, okay. I usually get out of my uh, PDF file just by hitting the escape. And I have done so a number of times now. And okay, it so just, it's on your computer probably then. Yes, it seems that it's just uh, it froze from from whatever reason. I don't um, I don't know if it's related to the chat or not. Uh, I'm sorry, but I think we're, if if we are to not waste too much time, I'll just have to to leave the meeting and start again. I'm very sorry. Let, um, we will wait. Yeah, let's let's do that because otherwise I don't know what will happen. And while you are doing that, uh, um... It's too late, Alain. She, she already left. So. Oh, she already left. No, no, but I want to answer the question about analyticity of elements. Uh, because there is something which might be confusing because you might think that when you take X star, you get the complex conjugate function. But what you get is the complex conjugate function evaluated on Z bar, and that's an analytic function. And that's just a small point. <laughs> I, hope, I hope she manages because that's pretty awful. I mean, you know, when you are stuck with a computer, I mean, <laughs> it's maybe, maybe Alan, you can take questions from the audience. <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, you know, I'm just uh, <laughs> just enjoying the talk. I mean, it's good. It's it's a very good system, provided one doesn't get into these problems with yeah. with a computer. I mean, this is a really problematic indeed, really. Okay, so Piotr Solkan is saying something. So 
Ah, okay. It's saying something on uh, on uh, analytic element, Alan. Did you yeah, see? Yeah, well, no. I mean, otherwise it's very easy. I mean, you just smooth the element by a function by doing a smearing, and then you find that when you translate this smear function, it amounts to smearing to translating the test function that you have used. So it's a triviality. I mean, it's a, the density is trivial. Ah, she's coming back now. Okay, Nadia, welcome back. Now we see the, the slides. We, we don't see her. Mm. Ah, but no, she's not there. She's in. Oh, Nadia, she is. Ah, okay, she's probably talking. Nadia. Yeah. So have I have I actually talked for myself for the last? Uh, I think for of... for for few quite few minutes. Yes. Okay. Well. Uh, was... a... Okay. Let's start again, but not from the very beginning. Let's start. Not the very beginning. I just can I just leave this slide on? Yes. Okay. We're good with it. Okay. So. Okay. This is one example where we have those schema states. They appear to be quite different depending on the bats as we are. And as I said, with the types in this critical interval uh, from one to two, there's a unique schema state. And as shown by Lacan and Nezhvev, it's a type three one state. Above beta, the state get become type one and then they stay type one. A, di a different type of example now, <laughs> I cannot move my file again. I'm sorry, what I don't understand what is um, happening. I, I gave another seminar not so long ago and there was no, no issue. Um, so if I move this somewhere else. Walter, can we maybe proceed without recording? I, I just don't see what to do with my file. It works very, it, it worked perfectly before, but I, I just cannot move in the file. Uh, is it, there are several possibilities. It, maybe we can make Nadia co-host, Walter, one thing. And somebody is suggesting to reduce from full screen. So maybe you can try also that. Yes, could you could you please make okay let's try see if this works. Walter. Or maybe from another PDF reader. These are all suggestions from the public. Right, but I've I've never had issues with my this the one here, so um, I don't know what to what to say. Okay, stop sharing. What is happening here?
So I'm back, Walter. Can I ask you to make me co-host and I will try to share screen in that way? Yeah, I already did that. So you're also okay. co-host. Okay, good. Thank Let you. me do it again because you kind of, I think you left and uh, can I find you. Yeah, and the, 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 Third front top. Yeah, Third and, front and top. The top. Under your name, in fact, Walter. Well, it depends. I mean, it's all different at each. Yeah. All right, we were sure you're right. You're right. <laughs> no, but the all star on the top. <laughs> That's right. Nadia, you are a co host now. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see if I can do this now. Um, all right. So I'm going to go here and do this again. Okay, so okay. far so good. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, so maybe now I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just, we'll do the rest at double speed as-, uh, as No, 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 no. Okay, so uh, uh, let me talk about the Bauslack solid harmonoids with matching signs and about what I mean by that. So the Bauslack solid harmonoids uh, are a family of monoids modeled on the um, Bauslack solid groups. So for parameters, integer parameters C and D with the same sign, uh, the bounce lock solid monoid of parameters C and D is generated is the unit cell sub monoid of the group, uh, the bounce lock solid group with parameters C and D generated by two elements A and B. Those are the fract A and fract B with the relation, the one relation A, B to the C is B to the D A. Elements in a bounce lock solid monoid have a normal form. So in this case, all the powers of B are pulled to the left and the, all the uh, exponents of the B, so it's a B to the I1A, B to the A2A and so on. There are numbers uh, of such pairs of B to the I theta A's is determined by a number or an, an element theta S called the height of S, which essentially counts the number of A's that A should be the, the frac A, counts the number of generators A in the composition. And all elements have this type of normal form. And whenever D is at least one in modulus, there's a, there's a way to uh, scale those generators. At least the A is scaled with D to the IT. The B stays unchanged. And there's a result of Lisa Clark, Astrid and Hoove and Ian Rayburn um, describing the equilibrium states for this Bauslux law normonoid. Uh, where the signs of the C and D are, are matching, so either post positive or both negative, in which case there's a symmetric situation, of course. The ground states, now I go the other way, somehow reverse order. The ground states, they will be parameterized by states on C star N, so somehow they're determined on the C star algebra generated by uh, the generator B. The KMS beta states um, above one, and all the way to infinity taking limits of KMS beta states are parameterized by normalized traces on sister of Z. At one, which we regard to as a special element, a critical point, there is a, there is a KMS one state. And for parameters um, C and D, both one of them, at least two, so they shouldn't just be one, both of them. The KMS one state will be unique precisely when C does not divide D or rather D does not divide C. In the case that C is a multiple of D, one can construct, the, the actually Clark and Hoop and Rapen constructed at least two uh, KMS one states. Um, so that's a second example I wanted to give. Now, a third example comes from self-similar actions. So this is a situation, let's say, where I'll, I'll refer to Nekrashevich, uh, also work of Grigorchuk, introducing the very important constructions in group theory. So from our point of view, we look at the finite alphabet X. We form X star, the free monoid on this alphabet X. And we're assuming that G is a group with the rule of acting. And the rule is G acting on a letter X in X concatenated with a finite word V is determined by concatenating a new letter Y with the action of a new group element H on the finite word V. So here we imagine that G and X are given, and then there's a unique pair of a new letter Y and a new element H in the group describing the action. So this is the self, self similarity is encoded in the fact that this G does not act back, but rather a new group element H, which is to be regarded as a restriction of G to the letter X, that one acts. 
and the letter X has been changed to Y. Now, there is a, a sister algebra, so Dekrashevich associated conspiracy type algebras to such a situation. Um, later, Marcel Laka, Jackie Ramage, and Raymond May Whitaker um, looked at the tuplets algebra of that um, Kuhn-Spivner algebras for the same module. They formed the tuplets algebra, tau m. m is a module, I will not describe it. It's naturally associated to xg. It has natural dynamics. What does it do? For every finite word, there is a generator in the tuplets algebra t sub v. That one is being scaled by e to the i t times the length of v. Now for the parameters beta above the logarithm of this, the, 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 the size of x, the, the size of the alphabet. The simplex of Kama's beta states is going to be a finely homomorphic to the simplex of normalized traces on this group, full group sister algebra of G. There are plenty of them. Again, there's a critical value. There's a beta equal to the logarithm of the size of X. One can produce a Kama's beta state here. It's going to be the unique one assuming uh, certain conditions on the action, which uh, I, are, I will refer to, they're called that uh, contracting, they, this happens if the self similar action is contracting, which roughly means that when we are given uh, group elements G and we try to restrict to various elements uh, finite, uh, finite words, the set of restrictions is somehow controlled by a finite set. So I will not give the precise definition. But the interesting thing is that this unique MS state when restricted to sister G produces a trace and it actually produces a nice interesting, the new trace on the sister algebra of the, of the self-similar group. So what I've shown you here three different type of example. There was this monoid n times n cross, the bounce lock solitor and those self-similar action. Now there isn't obviously a monoid here, but there will be one just by incorporating the action of G when the, on the finite words that can be put into a monoid structure. So, this brings us to those monoids, the right LCM or least common right multiples monoids. One can define them in a much larger uh, generality, the generality of categories. Um, and there's a, there is a very nice monograph uh, by De Ornois and uh, co-authors uh, on, on so-called Garcine monoids, describing a, a much, uh, much larger class of monoids for which one has those, uh, looks at those conditional type of multiples. So, if P is left constellative, we said an element R is a right multiple of an element P whenever R is of the form P sub S. Alternatively, P is a left divisor of R. So right multiples and left divisors come in pairs. Now, if we have both a P and a Q, obviously a common right multiple of those will just be an element R for which we can find uh, elements S1 and S2 so that R is a common multiple of P and Q. And P will be called right LCM or maybe conditional right LCM, provided that every time P and Q have a common right multiple, there is a least common right multiple. So examples here are numerous, free monoids, um, artin monoids, uh, bounce lock solitaire monoids, and as we will see, monoids that model the left similar, uh, the self similar actions, and many, many uh, the other classes. Okay, so from the point of view in, of uh, approaching sister algebras of those um, right LCM monoids, as I said, the, the, the somehow the fact that there is this uh, common right multiple allows that we think of S1 and S2 as some sort of ways of forming fractions in the monoid because we can form um, P inverse R and Q inverse R, and they allow us to sort of think of fractions in the monoids. Um, and this reflects nicely in the multiplication of the generators VP and VQ and their adjoints at the sistrogeral level. Um, so maybe the, we, we see them in, in the sistrogeral theory, those right LCM monoids in work of Manus Norling and um, where he's, he wasn't, I mean, he just looked at the condition, what it means to have this right LCM. He referred to it as, um, attributed it to Mark Lawson, uh, who called it a, the Clifford condition on a monoid, but it's really quite old. It goes back many, one finds it in many papers. So if P and Q have a common right multiple, then there is a least common right multiple. And there's also work of Nathan Brown, Jackie Ramage, David Robertson and Mike Whitaker around the same time where 
they looked at the construction of monoids due to Breen generalizing a construction group theory called the Zappaget product. So now a Zappaget product takes two elements, two sort of structures and puts them in a, in a type of very tight uh, sort of uh, interaction, which kind of generalizes um, semi-direct products, but is, is, is more suitable uh, to um, model, let's say, self-similar actions. And, and the four authors, Brown, Ramage, Robertson, and Whitaker, they looked at Zappaget products monoids. So I, A and U are monoids. This bow tie represents this type of product where there is both an action and restriction. And this turned out to model both self-similar monoids. So if I just put the action of G on the SpaceX star into this type of product, it defines a monoid. The bounce lock solitaire monoids, also the affine monoid, n times n cross. Although one would think that n times n cross is obviously the n corresponds to a and the n times correspond to u, but this is not the case. So it's it's a it's a much subtler, uh, it's certainly a much subtler way of, of describing the affine monoid as a Zappaget product. But it's a key, it's a useful general machinery. Chin Li of course, introduced a much uh, more general, situ I mean, a construction of semi-group cystrogevas for arbitrary left cancellative monoids. Uh, but, but through that perspective, one can so study cystrogevas of monoids, and we know they're generated by isometries, perhaps with additional properties. This right LCM has the strength that the only additional property we need to know is how to move adjoints past the V. So in fact, we have a spanning set for our semi-group algebra of the right LCM monoid, simply given by BP VQ star. So we don't have to worry about traditional relations. Okay, so trying to collect the results that we had in the beginning. So the theorem of Lacan Raber about the affine monoid n times n cross, the result of uh, Clark um, and Hoof Rayburn about KMS states for the bounce lock solitaire with matching sign and the result about the triplet charge of self-similar actions. In joint work with Zarafsar, uh, Nathan Brownlon and Nikolai Stammeyer, we, we defined a notion of an admissible right LCM. I put it in red, there's a lot hidden there with a scale, so that the monoid uh, homomorphism that I described at the beginning will have to have very specific values, not arbitrary in zero infinity, but in the natural numbers, and there will be restrictions on the inverse images it can take. But the scaling, the time evolution sigma t will still be defined by scaling the isometry with n of p to the i t. We form a, a zeta type of function. There are a couple of parameters that I haven't quite described there, but we essentially form, because this scale gives us special elements in transversals, tau n for every n, and all the reducible elements in the image are the elements where you don't have common factors. Um, and we sum over those, and then we sum over specific elements in the set Tn, which is like a transversal. It separates them in a finite set. And then we form a type of a zeta function. Assuming that this converges above a certain critical value beta c, then we have a result very similar to the ones that we've seen before, but some sort of subsuming them. So no KMS uh, stay below one, at least one in a critical interval from one to beta c, often unique, above a critical value, there are plenty, they're equivalent to normalized traces on the cis algebra of a very special monoid that I will get to, which I call the core submonoid of P. So again, traces on some other cis algebra describe all the type one type of um, KMS states above a critical value. And taking limits and forming KMS infinity states, again, uh, parameterizes um, through normalized traces gives all the KMS infinity states. Finally, dropping the assumption of trace, all the states on this substructure of, of uh, this core monoid, the special monoid, uh, this de defined in terms of um, taking right least common multiples, this defines, this distinguishes all the ground states or parameterizes them. Okay, so this is sort of subsumming some of the constructions that I've shown you at the beginning. And just to quickly list the admissible monoids. Um, so the one in the end, the affine one and variations of it where instead of acting with the entire n times, we can just act with some 
sub groups P generated by families of relatively prime numbers. Oh, and also the, as I said, in putting the action of G on X V on into a, a product of a monoid, this gives a right LCM monoid. So those are also covered in the theorem. And also this bounce lock solitor monoid where C and D have the same power. Um, Okay, so there was an assumption in this theorem, I said admissible, uh, which, which entails uh, some complications for both for the proof and for the statement. Admissible means a couple of things, uh, but I would like to just uh, explain what the core semigroup is because that enters and maybe gloss over the rest a bit. So John Crisp and Marcel Waka studied uh, artin monoids in the context of quasilitis uh, order monoids. And they, they identified uh, a monoid they called the core semigroup, which was later uh, used by Charles Starling in, in the, the more general context of those right LCM monoids. So what this P sub C, this core sub monoid does is that it collects all the elements which admit common right multiples with everything. So P sub C is the collection of all elements A and P such that Every time A and R have a common multiple, then there is a list. They, they, I mean, they, they always have a non-empty intersection. So then there will automatically be a right LCM of this A with everything in P. So this core monoid somehow gets everything, all the fractions that are possible to be made with elements in P. And that it naturally gives rise to an equivalence relation on the monoid saying that elements S and T are equivalent if they can be matched through, you can think of S and T, and then you make a square by putting a T and, a, and an S and your arrows match. So the S and the T, and then you put something from the core here and something from the core there and you complete your square. The, at the other extreme, there's something we call core irreducible where this matching is not at all possible except in case we put some invertible elements uh, which somehow uh, will mean that those elements can never, I mean, either they're in the same class or they can never be matched. Okay, so admissible is a list of four axioms. I will no go th not go through them. Essentially, it requires this, the existence of this homomorphism n from P to n and a couple of other assumptions, which we will get rid of and, uh, or show are superfluous for the results later on. Okay, so um, so what are we doing next? I mean, have, why, why would there be more interest in studying monoids and their equilibrium states? Well, essentially, because when we go back to the bounce lock solitor monoid, which is this monoid with generators A and B and the relation AB to the C is B to the D A for C and D, let's say greater than or equal to one, there's also a bounce lock solitor monoid with the opposite sign. So C and D, one is positive, the other is negative. And then we write this in the relations uh, in the following way. So we form this P2, I call it the bounce lock solitor monoid with opposite signs. What does it do? The plus just means I'm forming the monoid. So I don't form any inverses of elements, but they exist in the group. So I have the generators A and B and the relation will be B to the D, A, B to the C, A, where let's say, C and D have opposite signs. So um, this monoid, so now I'm assuming that both C and D are positive, but I'm acting with the exponent of minus D. So this is what it means that I have B to the D, A, B to the C is A. This is my relation now. Um, and Jack Spielberg showed that the two monoids I have here, P1 and P2 are very different when we start taking least common right multiples. So in the first monoid, the one with the matching signs, if I take an element of the form A, B, A inverse, I try to look at multiples, uh, common multiples of that in the group, I can always find one. I can find an element P uh, that sort of reduces this intersection to a single multiple. But if I try to do it in the group, in the monoid P2, this cannot be done because when I intersect the, the uh, AP, AB, A inverse P2 with P2, I don't find a single multiple in P2. In fact, I find an infinite uh, family. So for every integer M, AB to the M, uh, P2 will be there. And there's no way of reducing this union, absorbing it by a final one. 
So um, why, why is this AB to the M? How do we see this as an element of the monoid? Because M is, as I said, is, uh, it, it can be um, integer. So it can be negative. Well, we just hit it with, the, we, we pick some N that's so large that N C plus M is positive and we write AB to the M using the relation B to the D, A, B to the C is A. We write it as a product B lifted to the N D, A, B lifted to the N C plus M um, in, as an element of B2. So anyway, we have those normal forms, A, B to the M, we have an infinite family of them and they somehow can destroy the, the, the type of assign, uh, assumptions we needed to construct our KMS states in the admissible case. So this, this example is not admissible. So this Baumstock Soiter monoid with opposite signs, I should say it has other interesting properties uh, once it was uh, realized that uh, it, uh, it's, it behaves very differently from, um, from the one with matching signs. So I write it again. So B as C minus D, where C and D are positive integers greater than one. The relation is B to the D A, B to the C is A, and this forms the monoid. Uh, so one fact is that uh, this monoid, it's group embeddable. But in the terminology of Shin Li, does not admit any embedding in a group fulfilling the topless condition. And this has implications for cross product structure by this monoid. And this was the first example. So when, when the topless condition was used in a semi group theory, it was somehow maybe hoped for that it would be satisfied by any monoid and, and any group embedding, but it's not by this one. Another um, uh, Another feature of this monoid was observed by Astrid and Hoof, Britta and Uchink, uh, Camilla Senem and Dilian Yang in a recent paper that the group cisgender of this monoid is, is nuclear. In fact, they proved a more, much more general result uh, valid for a class of uh, one relator monoids. And the crucial thing again is that this monoid in a certain sense, it, it, it has one can even write down an infinite descending chain of elements for the order. So it's B to the N, D, A as, as we vary the N. So there's an infinite descending chain. So in monoid um, terminology, this would mean that it's, it's non-Notharian on one side. So that's very special. So one cannot operate with a regular length function. One needs a sort of advanced value, uh, version of a length function for this monoid. Anyway, so that was a side, just because I wanted to tell you that this monoid is quite interesting and has certainly produced in, um, interesting operate algebras. So trying to accommodate this monoid, um, the, right, the, the, the Baumschlag solitaire with opposing signs, we went back. So this is the, the joint work with Brownlow, Ramage, and, and, and um, Nico Stalmeyer. So we went back with to the, the tools we had and we went back to what we called admissible and realized that because this one wasn't admissible, we could actually do with less and still obtain a good result. So we're just assuming that P is a right LCM monoid. We still need to use the core P sub C, the sum monoid of all the elements A, such that A and P always has a common right multiple, therefore a, a, a right, LCM. We still assume that there's a, a, a function n on, from p to n as generalized scale a homomorphism. And we define a partition function, but this time we only have this equivalence relation with respect to the core monoid. So for, for a given p, the equivalents are all the q's for which we can find uh, a matching square p a is q b. We define a partition function by summing n of p to the minus beta modulo this relation. Again, assuming that we are in an interval of convergence for this zeta function, we can then prove that for the system sister p with this n, uh, there are no KMS beta states below one. If beta is greater than beta c, the KMS beta states are in affine homeomorphism with the normalized traces on the subalgebra of the core. So the subalgebra of the core somehow ext contains, extracts all the information we need for, to, to produce those positive states on, on our big sister algebra just by knowing locally values. Okay, so this is a parameterization, but of course, one of the very interesting questions also regarding to type is what happens at the critical uh, points of, the, of, the, of this uh, partition function of convergence. So we, are ex we expect to maybe find uniqueness at those critical points. So how am I doing on time? Do we have to 
I guess I have to finish very soon, but um, okay, let me. <laughs> So um, the key to studying uniqueness is um, with, with the data of a monoid, the core monoid is equivalence determined by the core monoid, uh, the state, the, the, the scale n and the zeta function. Uh, we define so-called absorbing elements in the monoid to be elements uh, in, the, in the monoid so for a pair of elements A and B in the core and some given N in the range of this scale function, we look at the so-called absorbing elements. So those are all the equivalence classes of elements that are mapped to value this integer value N under the scale, such that we can match A as C with B as C, where C is an element in the core. Of course, this only makes sense for semigroups where, I mean, this is only non-empty for elements that are not um, right cancellative, but there are plenty of right, not right cancellative elements in this, uh, or monoids in this, uh, in this world. So in what we're studying. So this is a sort of absorbing elements, or in a certain sense, they are trivially fixed elements. And we can show that at, uh, parameter value beta equal one, there is a KMS one state. And the state, let's call it psi one, it's determined on, um, on a spanning element of the form VAVP star as an asymptotic uh, value of those, the proportion of those absorbing elements. So it's a limit of the size of those elements, absorbing elements for a pair AB with respect to N. So it's some, so some limits, asymptotic limit. And we can also ask, when is this unique? Okay, so the result is that this KMS1 state is the unique one, providing that yet another asymptotic limit where those absorbing elements that I had, A, the set capital A, upper A, B, N, sits inside a set of sort of non-symmetrized fixed points. So the kind of, absorbing points inside the, the fixed points, that family has to asymptotically go to zero. So F, I've, decided, I've defined this set here. So this is sort of the, the fixed points, the F, A, B, comma, N. So for all the classes of elements mapped to this natural number N, so that I can match ASC with BSD for some CFD. So inside here, I have the absorbing ones. And if that asymptotically goes to zero, there's a unique state. So now this condition may look a little strange, but in fact, it's very natural. And the way to see that it's natural um, is best reflected in the language of um, G regular points for self-similar actions. So let me return to self-similar actions. So, so given a faithful step similar action with a countable uh, group G, form the space of right infinite words with the product topology. Now a definition of Nekrashevich um, sets the scene for the so-called G regular points. So uh, given a, an element G in the group and a point in this infinite, uh, right infinite words, this counter set X to the N. So a point is G regular, or also called G generic. If either, um, I guess the V should be W, if either is not fixed by the G or it lies in the interior of the set of fixed points for G. So, um, okay, so once again, the W and the V are a bit mixed up, but so the point is not in the interior, is in the interior of the set of fixed point means that the W starts with some finite word where this word is in a, it's absorbing 4G and the identity at the number N given by scaling of X to the length of the V. So um, I will try to wrap up in a moment. Um, so 
now take the probability measure, the Bernoulli measure on this counter space, x to the n, the, the product of the uniform distributions. Then it turns out that um, they essentially <laughs> mu every point is capital G regular, so is regular for all the points in the group, precisely when the condition we had uh, identified for the uniqueness of a KMS state is satisfied for the monoid uh, given by the semi by the Zappache products of X star bow tie G. So the condition of uniqueness that was sort of sort of that we found in very abstract terms just by working uh, in, in, in the monoid uh, world and trying to identify uniqueness for the KMS state turns out to have this measure theoretical counterpart. So the set of those G regular points, the capital G regular points, this is G delta set. Um, however, we are in a sort of measure theoretic point. So if they're all, all the, if the measure is supported on those G regular sets, then we have uniqueness of the KMS state. And in fact, very recently, just a couple of months after we finished our paper, uh, uh, Kisuke Yoshida had a paper on archive in which he studied von Neumann algebras associated with XG. And he found the same condition. So more precisely, what Kisuke Yoshida proved was that for every self-similar action, XG, where G is countable, you look at the points, you look at the family uh, or the set of G regular points, the one that I had before, he proved that the measure, the Bernoulli measure there on the set is either one or zero. So either it's the measure is zero or the measure is one. I, we don't know examples where the measure is zero, but assuming that it's one, which is what our condition for uniqueness, uniqueness says, he also proved that there's a unique MS state on the Kunz-Pimsner type algebra. Uh, the, the, the temperature here is the logarithm of the scale of X simply because the dynamics is scale. So it just changed from one to the logarithm of the size of X, but it's the same type of uniqueness. And moreover, uh, Yoshida proves that the von Neumann algebra corresponding to the unique equilibrium state at the logarithm of the size of X is an A of D type three, three size of X inverse factor whenever G is amenable. So he computed the type of the von Neumann algebras. Um, but interestingly, he found exactly the same condition, um, just working directly with the self-similar actions. Okay, so um, maybe I will not describe the main technique. It all goes through a FAC module and induction, a la, similar to what has been done lots of times before and inspired by work of Lakan and Ashveya for the triplet charge of a bimodule. But let me finish by uh, saying two things about uniqueness, um, so alternate approaches. So I started by saying that if we have sister algebra uh, with lots of uh, uh, isometries, and if we are to have a, a equilibrium state, it will need to have prescribed values on certain projections. And we started from there and tried to classify KMS states on those uh, sister algebras. And we found um, a necessary, um, Sorry, we find a sufficient condition. So we found that condition one that's sim uh, equivalent to the, the, the sad saying that mu almost all points are G generic or G regular in a self similar action. And very recently, through the group oidification uh, pictures of Sergei Nezhveyev, Nikolai Stammeyer looked at the right LCM monoid sister algebra from a point of view of an inverse semi group, looked at the groupoid picture of this. So we're assuming now that n is just any monoid. So n shouldn't go to, to infinity, it should go to the interval zero infinity. That's a typo. So the scale n goes from p to zero infinity. And now let's assume we have a probability measure mu n on some space. There is a boundary space E of p hat of p, which can be cons composed, uh, constructed very similar to this Cantor set x n. And this measure has prescribed values on the cylinders on cylinder sets is that P corresponding to P. So this is very exactly what I sort of explained that they, there need to be prescribed values on certain sub um, structures. So that value is N of P to the minus one. Then there is unique KMS one state. If for all distinct AP with a common right multiple and the same value of the scale, the measure of the set of trivial fixed points coincides with the measure of the set of fixed points. So this is in particular shows that the sufficient condition that we found for the uniqueness is also necessary. And finally, I should say that John Claremont and Aidan Sims established uniqueness of the KMS state of the critical temperature in another context. And that's 
something that generalizes self interactions of groups on graphs on group on 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 let's say the the are trees so self interactions you think of your group acting on a on a root infinity rooted tree there's a construction of self interactions of groupoids on graphs due to um, Lacar, Ramage, Rayburn, and Whitaker, and Claremont and Sims employed a different type of technique based on sort of iteration of a self of a of a certain self map on the simplest of traces to identify conditions for uniqueness. So a certain fixed point of that uh, type of self iteration produces a unique KMS uh, state. So with this, I finish. Uh, my talk. Uh, sorry for having to spend okay. slightly bit more time. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you for a nice talk with a little bit of uh, suspense. So thank you. I yeah yes. Yeah, so. Don't worry, don't worry, Nadia. It was fun. I I don't I don't no. Certainly it's not. It's certainly something happened somewhere. I do not worry. <laughs> uh, okay. Any, no, sorry. I do worry. It hasn't happened to me before, but uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it will not happen again because the, I mean yeah. Uh, any question from the audience? Uh, anybody wants to ask any question? Alan, you should uh, unmute yourself, Alan. So, so uh, I have really a completely trivial question, which is the following. After all, you know, the um, uh, KMS condition is a way to, to replace the cyclic property of the trace by introducing some Okay, some transformation. But uh, so while you were talking, I was just wondering whether the, when you consider all these monoids, after all, you know, I mean, the best monoid we know is language. I mean, the writing in the language. Mm. So I, I was wondering whether one could find some interesting stuff in the people who have been studying languages, you know, like anagrams and so on and so forth, and, uh, and get something interesting from there. I, I don't know. I mean, it's really a shot in the dark completely. But um, what I mean is I, I always like to illustrate the non-commutativity by the anagrams, by the fact that, you know, if you pass to the commutative, you lose an enormous amount of information, which is contained precisely in the fact that we are not allowed to permute letters. So, you know, I, I, I am really curious to see if in the literature on the languages, one might find some of these monoids or some of these relations and so on and so forth. I mean, as I said, this is just a shot in the dark. I mean, just to to to, mm. say, to provoke something. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, it's a it's a very yeah very interesting point, very interesting question. And certainly, those monoids determined by by some small number of generators and some interesting relations. Um, they, they are intriguing and they they do form the type of class where we just see them that they they somehow fit into some of the the, the tricks we've been doing some of the uh, yes, techniques exactly we've been employing and and as i said i mean somehow so there's this yeah i mean there's this uh, uh, work by by de ornois uh, that does one relator monoids have a very rich theory the artentis monoids have a very rich theory Everything that's built upon a braid type of thing. I mean, there's right. where you sort hi, of move hi, things hi. around. What Those I, are, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But what I had in mind was to try to find, you know, out of these various monoids that you have uh, uh, explored, if when you take uh, words in a given language and you view them as elements in the monoid by some way, uh, we know that, uh, you know, if, if you make something trivial, if you make the monoid totally commutative, then you get the notion of anagram. But there could be finer notions that one obtains by actually, you know, writing the words in, in another monoid, not the trivial one obtained by mm -hmm. making a single community. So that was more or less what I had in mind. But okay, right. I mean, as I said, it's a, it's a very question. It's a, no, it's a, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, but there's, yeah. yeah, there's potential for looking beyond those. Okay, thank you. A a any other question? Or oh, remark? Anybody? Okay. So thank you, Nadia. Thank you. And uh, goodbye, everyone. And uh, see you next week. Thank you. See you. Take care. Safe, safe. Thanks. See you. Thanks.